Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Maria Bailey. So Maria Bailey is an ex-international supermodel turned Zen monk. And that is, she is as interesting as that sounds. Um, Also master certified developmental coach, developmental geek, integral coach, sorry. Uh, Someone I've known for a couple of years from the Integral Conference and joining us, I believe, from Boulder today. Maria, welcome. Thank you, Mark. So excited to be here. So tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get interested in the body? Well, I got interested in the body when I was being born. I was screaming desperately and trying to get breath. So I guess in my world, um, the the in the body is so linked to this human experience. So um, I don't know that I had a an introduction to, oh, this is when I got interested. Since I was a little girl, I grew up in Venezuela and it was um, just this... Uh, this fascination of the the somatic of whether it was planing in the mud under the mango tree or just the deliciousness of eating mangoes or um, just maybe the the cry or I want this or how I experience life. So I I just think it's part of, it's an, an integral part of my human experience from little. Okay, I mean, let's start maybe with your first career. Um, I don't know much about the modeling world and what is it like in terms of the experience of the body? You know, is it very objectifying being photographed or asked to pose in uncomfortable positions? My, um, my wife's actually got a bit of training as a model and she showed me some of the things she'd learned. And I was quite horrified by sort of things like she would hold one leg up in a way quite uncomfortably. So as the sort of, it didn't look like it was fat and this kind of thing. And I, I was like, wow, imagine being in that position on a daily basis with people taking pictures of you or ever. So just because it's fascinating to me, it's so not my world. Could you speak a little bit of that about, 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 that, about that experience? Absolutely. Well, first I want to, you know, speak of just how things have changed because I don't know how old your wife is, but, you know, before it was actually a job. It was actually a profession where, yes, you actually knew, had to know about your body and how to, you know, like an artist or, or like a gymnast or anyone using their body, body as an instrument, you would have to know about your body and what position it needed to be to give the image that the client was needing. So I I think nowadays is different, but I the I think the point I want to make is that what was interesting is that I didn't get those lessons, right? I, I kind of jumped in into this career. I never thought I would, you know, I was a bit of a, a tomboy in Venezuela, and you know, to me, models were these gorgeous ten feet, not ten feet, but six foot, you know, blonde model, German models, and and I was, you know, five foot seven, Latino girl in Caracas and 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 then I think if so I want to speak of the and modeling as you can look at it from well yes you you are the object you are standing in front of the camera you you are representing so many people's vision right you have the art director you have the the brand that you're representing you have you know the makeup artist the stylist and the the actual outfit that you're wearing so so in some ways if you look at it as a as a art form it's so it's such an opportunity right to to embody uh, uh, so many visions so I can only speak for my experience, and my experience was that after 25 years, it, it first started being just, well, what am I doing? I had no idea. I was standing in front of the camera and um, had no clue what, they, what people wanted of me. But as, as the years went by, it was, it was this mix of being aware of where each part of my body, kind of like what your, your wife was saying, like, so my it's kind of like having the vision of the, um, how do you say, like the frame. I knew the square around me. So if my hand was here by the side of my face and the other one here by my shoulder, like I already, I always knew in in a very graphic way, the shape that my body was taking. Yes. You can then, sorry, go ahead. 
for my jump in. I think this is quite interesting from an embodiment point of view because I, I feel like it's become the norm now amongst uh, young people, particularly young women, but young people generally, that the uh, perceived body is getting a lot of attention. So if we think of embodiment as the subjective experience of the body, then people who are trained as models, or I would say many people have grown up with a sort of the camera culture, the, the endemic kind of spread of cameras everywhere, and image kind of management that you'll see in sort of, you know, every young girl on their Instagram, um, means that there can be a lot of attention on how one's body is seen from the outside rather than subjectively experienced. And I love, I love that you're bringing this because then that's maybe the difference between the, 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 how would you say like the the technical and the master mm -hmm. right so great so you can put in a screw and take out a screw and you know the technicality of that but then so you know how to stand in front of a camera you know how to wear a jacket but then soon enough soon enough like maybe six years into the career i i precisely touch into what you're talking about the more subjective beauty sure you have a beautiful body shape or a beautiful picture that you know you captured something graphically that is um alluring but but what i what i understood that it was something more subjective it was something that came from behind the eyes it's something more of this when we talk about somatic to me it includes yes it is the physical form but it's also like this current like what does this body houses Yes. And I, I often think people that are very interested in beauty sometimes are really missing a trick here that yeah. in, for me, the most beautiful people, the sort of external form is a part of it, but it's really only one small part. And it just, particularly as people age, it just seems that, that the sort of inner game, as it were, becomes so important. I, I wonder why this is not, um, uh, hasn't spread or sort of word of this hasn't spread in the same way perhaps as some of these um you know i see modeling postures for example very common just in the street now there's photography skills have become much more widespread the quality of sort of pictures you'll generally see on people's facebook or whatever has really improved the last few years and certain countries that i work in like russia kind of sort of led the way but it's um it's spread but some of this sort of inner beauty is um less discussed less talked about and to me it seems very obvious I think your blog <clears throat> is about embodiment, right? So then what, what does it mean to be embodied? Is it just the shape of your body or is it just what you look like? Mm. Or what, what does it mean to be embodied? And so I think with this new age of, of virtual reality um, and information moving so fast, right? That there's just a lot of information and is that we have an idea of of ourselves we have an idea of our bodies we so so in some ways like this this is my question about embodiment it's like mm -hmm. we even even as we you know we do coaching or we do embodiment or you, you even do tai chi or you it's a lot of it is the the idea of what i'm doing and and i'm seeing a lot less of the direct experience of the physical body and the same even with if you even talk you know if, if we even talk about zazen or just the formal sitting meditation practice um one of my biggest challenges has been to just drop like drop the mind to just a direct experience of sitting what what is it right the 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 butt on the chair the you know Anyway, it's, it's, I think it's fascinating what you're saying. It's like, yeah, the pictures on Facebook, the pictures on Instagram, like people are, um, again, the shapes perhaps are more beautiful. And even the apps have, then, you know, they can wash off whatever and make you beautiful. So that maybe aesthetically when we're looking at it, um, they're more beautiful. I just have a question of, of embodiment, right? Sure, sure. And, and, you know, I think there is a tangible difference. You can see if it's someone meditating on a rock in Goa or Thailand who's posing for the camera versus someone who is actually meditating on that rock and the photographer happens to have caught that image. I, I think there is a tangible difference in those images. And I think it's, it doesn't take that trained an eye to see the sort of embodied, embodied version versus the disembodied impersonation. 
Yeah. And, and so that's more the subjective intangible. Like I remember one time in, in a job and the art director, I, I was with another model and the art director is giving instructions to the other model and, you know, saying like, okay, so you're both, you're friends, you're talking, you're shopping and you're, you know, you have your bags and all that. And then he looks at me and says, and you do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in that moment, I just left. It's like, oh, I mean, I know what he's talking about, right? He knows that I know. and we all know what it is that Maria Bailey does. And, and after, I mean, now after years, when I look back at it, what he was talking about was presence. Yeah. But of course he, he couldn't name it. And I don't know that I could have named it then, but, but what I was at that point of modeling, I wasn't selling the face. I wasn't, I mean, of course this, the face was part of it and, and how I was already professionally knowing how to move and give the art director what they wanted. But truly what I, at that point, what, why I was so uh, successful and lucrative in my job, it was more the quality of presence yeah. um, that they could feel and they could sense, but couldn't pinpoint to. You know, I've heard professional dancers say the same thing. You know, the really, really good ones, the top end ones, that's what they're paid for. It's not just doing the jump or the twist or the turn. It's the presence within that that becomes tangible, even to people that don't have a language for that. So, um, you know, in a way, it doesn't surprise me that that exists in the modeling world, you know, as I've seen it crop up in other places. Um, I mean, you know, what would you say you learn in that profession that may be useful or interesting to embodiment people? Because I, you know, I can imagine um, there's a certain prejudice or a certain sort of almost like a snobbery against people who are, are modeling. And um, a good friend of mine was a model turned into a yoga teacher. And I've kind of talked to him quite a lot about it. So, you know, the, the sort of general picture of the model will be something like, you know, Zoolander or something quite comical. Um, so I'd be curious to sort of turn that snobbery on its head a little bit and say, you know, is there anything the embodiment world could learn from, from that career you had? First of all, it's like that you that you are that you are beautiful, you know. There, like I think um, often I got feedback of you know I would get compliments and just say a simple thank you. Um, sometimes I think we err on the on the side of we need to be humble or we need to I, I don't know. There, there's something of how how do we handle our our physical form? right? Whether it is in the ways that you think you're lacking or in the ways that you think you have a lot, I think at some point it's just is. I know that I come into a room and I have an impact. And so the, the, I think uh, what the, the, some models or, or beautiful women that can just relax and be relaxed in who they are and carry it with a certain level of dignity, I think then they truly become models, right? It's kind of redefining a model life, right? Like you are, are you a model because you're beautiful or are you a model for women and men or for human beings, just the way you carry yourself? So I would say that that is one. Yeah, I've seen something about um, a difference in sort of grace or class in how certain very beautiful people carry themselves and and respond to that. So, for example, you know, I've given compliments to beautiful women many times, and sometimes they'll turn around and say, "Oh, thanks," or they'll be like, "Look at me with contempt, like you're out of my, you know, I'm out yeah. of your league." Other times, they'll be embarrassed and push it away, like oh, it's nothing, you know. And, and there's been a few times when, you know, women's looked me in the eye and gone, "Thank you so much," uh, and maybe it was like, "Thank you so much," and actually, I'm married, but thank you so much, and. I've gone, wow, and I've walked away from that experience feeling like, wow, that person has a noble beauty, not just a physical beauty, in their, mm -hmm. in their grace, in the, in the class with which they handled that compliment, which transcends simply the fact they have a, you know, certain facial features. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about is, is sort of like a generosity. I remember um, I was talking to a woman um, you know, high on finances and she, she, you know, she moves a lot of money. And, and so she was very interested about my work. And, and so she asked, it's like, didn't you feel, you know, objectified and, you know, wasn't it horrible? And, you know, I really thought about it because actually have I felt objectified, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's an honest question. And I have, I mean, sometimes, but maybe because I'm South American and, you know, I was, brought up with being objectified <laughs> you know it's kind of part of the the, the culture it, it it never 
um, rubbed me the wrong way. Never, I was never offended when I was being looked at. It. But what I what I saw in that moment, what I said to, to this woman was like, well, when people come and ask you for money for funding, do you feel offended? Yep. And she's like, well, no, of course not. Like I have, and I, I want to give, and I want to be generous. And I'm like, great. So I have lots of it also. I have yep. lots of beauty. So when people look at me or when people comment or whatever, I have lots of it. And so I feel very generous. And so I think that's what you're pointing to, um, Mark. It's like when a woman has this nobility of that generosity of you look at her, if you have this openness of, yeah, like, you know, you don't take from me because you're looking. I got lots of it. It's just who I am. Yeah. And and that just takes us, you know, to to this also, like, I want to go back to the embodiment. You know, it's not just how you look, because there are many of, of just pretty women out there. Or, right. uh, and let's just not say women. And men, there are plenty of handsome, gorgeous men out there. And 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 it's not just that. It's, it's, it's something more. And so, again, is embodiment just what we look like? Or is embodiment is, is more like what? courses like what runs through this vehicle sure some aesthetics helps you know um but but it, there there's more like the life force or the the what courses through this body that it, then it becomes attractive then it becomes beautiful then we are we we want to look at it we yeah we, we're just attracted to yeah yeah it's interesting the cultural piece here i'm in germany at the moment and i've been with a russian colleague and we were doing some embodied yoga around sensuality pose. And it was, you know, very difficult for many of the German women to ask them. I said, you know, uh, my colleague taught it and I taught it sort of male, female versions. And, um, you know, of the people there, I said, who's comfortable in this pose? And only one in 10 people raised their hands. And I've, I've taught that pose in, say, Romania, and it was nine out of 10. Uh, there was yeah. a very clear difference in comfort with sexuality, comfort with a certain the beautiful aesthetic. Um, that's quite different in Germany. And it was quite, my, my Russian colleague had never really left Russia very much before. And she was quite shocked at the different cultural attitude to beauty and female beauty, particularly um, in Germany. Um, and, you know, she's a strong, powerful woman. So it's not like she's, you know, oppressed or something. She's just got a very different cultural attitude. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that South American attitude. Because we, in personal growth, like most people come from Asia, the United States, or some from Europe. And, there's not that much South American influence on uh, the fields of things like embodiment and Zen and yoga. I, we've only had a, two or three people on the show from that entire continent. If we speak culturally, we're definitely a sensual, um, you know, it's the romance language, right? And I think when you get into these warm countries, right, it, it, it's just sweet fruits and hot temperatures and sweaty bodies. And, you know, we don't need a, a lot of clothes. <laughs> so, so already in the, in the culture of it, right, it's more acceptable. I wonder also, um, and, and I think South America, in the mix of the Spaniards and the natives, it was a lot more, um, it wasn't as much segregated. You know, there was a lot of mix. So, so in the mestizos, so you have uh, a lot of this, you know, kind of like the, the, the native drumming, blood flowing with, yeah, the European sophistication. So I think, you know, in terms of time and culture, we're, we're still resolving those, you know, th these bloods coming together of what does it mean to be Latina is you you know it's native drums and mm. and there's, there's and, something about yeah. a, a different understanding of female power and I know this is one of your subjects that yeah. I like you yeah. talk about that when I hear my Russian colleagues or my even South European colleagues compared to North European and definitely South American there's a different understanding of uh, some of the potentials of female power and certain things that may even be seen as sort of um, you know women being oppressed in Northern Europe. Um, would actually be seen like, no, 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 you're misunderstanding that. That's actually a way in which women are powerful. And I, I feel like this discussion is really like of the times now. And I, I would love to hear some, you know, more in the public domain um, 
uh, from the sort of, you know, I've lived in Brazil, I've got a Ukrainian wife, and I, I see a lot of powerful femininity really owned in a way from some of those cultures that isn't in Western and Northern Europe. Um, so I'd love you to talk a little bit about sort of feminine power and then maybe we can go to feminine shadow from there. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I think we first need to define, you know, not define, but locate ourselves into, well, what are you aware of or what you're not aware of? Right. And, and then, cause I think what the, maybe the, what I, what I see in South America is women. I mean, and, and by the way, I'm, I don't mean awareness, like capital A awareness of like, we're, we're conscious and we're awake and responsible, but they, they do have an awareness or they, they caught on that they have an impact. And so like in Venezuela, they say that the women have the last word. Sorry, that men have the last word. And it's, si, mi amor. Yes, honey. And so there's this game of women, like women are, um, maybe I'll even say it, cunning enough to know what it is that the other women need or men need. What, what, what do you need? And how can I give you what it is that you need in order for me to then get what I need? Right, so this kind of and so, yeah, and you know, I sometimes hear this framed as um, because women don't have real power, they have to use this indirect form of power, and I and I sometimes see it and go, wow, this looks just like a much more effective form of power to me, and uh, that um, and obviously this could come into stereotypes and uh, you know sort of misogynist attitudes about women's cunning and things like that, but there there are you know really seriously recorded. Uh, differences in emotional intelligence between genders this is you know not controversial to any scientist who does psychological tests yeah yeah so so then i like to frame it so the way i see it is you're always exercising power sorry you're yeah you're always trying to exercise power now the catch is well do you have enough influence to impact the way you want to impact is another thing Mm. But in some ways, men and women are always making bids with whatever you have to influence in whatever direction you want. Again, you may have the influence or not. It may work out or not, but you're always making the bid. And so whether you are the kind of, and again, I'll speak for myself because I'm a, I'm a woman, like whether you know, you're an extrovert, loud, you ruffle feathers. Well, in some ways, that's the currency that I have to play in the game, right? To enter the bid, right? And so, well, I know I step in, I have a certain presence, I have a certain voice, and then and, and, and whether it's consciously or unconsciously, I'm constantly making bids. I have friends that are more quiet, that their silence is really strong. They are very aware that, um, uh, that with their silence, they either give or, or take away. Um, juice to somebody that is trying to lead. And so that's their bid for power. And so, so yeah, that's how I challenge this idea of, I mean, this is very, we're getting into a very controversial <laughs> topic, but it's like, so the, the women who talk about, like to me, women who use their victimhood, use their victimhood, who tell the story who, of how it's been hard for them right? Um, what, I, I, what I would love to say to them is like, first of all, I'm sorry. Yes, this did happen to you, right? Like it's true and it happens. And, and, and certain, in certain situations, things are not fair or are not equal. And, and that's still happening. That is true. As, uh, if we go back to as a model, what I, what, what I want to say is that can you also see the, the side of how you might even have used the situation or you tried to use the situation yeah. and it just didn't pan out the way you wanted it. Cause as a model is like, I mean, I remember the first time I got to Milan and I remember the first time I was, you know, um, taken for free dinner mm -hmm. and I was delighted. I, I mean, I was 19. I had no money. I was hungry. It's like, Please, yes, feed me. And if I need to be talking to you and doing whatever I need to do that night for you to feed me, go ahead. I, you know, I'll play the game. Yeah, beautiful, right? women, beautiful women don't starve. 
many bad yeah. things happen to them, but they don't starve. Exactly. And so, well, not exactly. Well, so, so you, I was, I was, play, you know, you play that currency. Now that night at the end of the night, when the guy that invited me hugged me, you know, he was like 30 years older than me and hugged me and whispered in my ear, Maria, this is not a good way to start being lovers. I'm like, right. Got it. You know, so just talking is not enough. So there's more in this deal, right? There's more. <laughs> And, and so I never accepted dinners anymore. I just want to take a step back because you said some really profound things I think are worth underlining and very much in the spirit of the times. You know, the, the first one is that the taking power out of the shadows, taking power, the denial of power is something I see happening a lot from different sides of people. And, and actually, there are always different forms of power and we're all making power plays and whether it's silence or victimhood or, you know, more overt, obvious forms of power, like money in this case, you know, trying to buy your affections or whatever, um, that to acknowledge that there's different forms of power and that they are being used, I think is the kind of first thing there. And also the, the caution I heard you express around this topic, you know, you said something like this is getting into controversial territory. That very caution shows that there's a form of power that me and you have to be quite careful of in this conversation. And that power is not, you know, the physical power of men hitting us or something, right? There's, there's a form of power that we know exists in the world, Maria. And if we don't tread carefully in this conversation, it's going to get us. The power is that, yes, I have the freedom and I can, you're inviting me in this uh, talk and what I have power and what I'm saying is going to land powerfully. So I need to be careful what I'm saying. And that is, there's a power to that. Absolutely. Right. But that's another that, valid, but from what you said before, it's like, this is potentially controversial topic. Or so what it, why it's controversial though, is that is what I was saying to you is what we're aware of or what we're not. And so I can, I can speak here from my perspective mm. and say, Hey, this is how I see it and make, you know, big statements of how I see it. But for, for the men and women that do not see it the way I see it, you know, they just, they, we just have different perspectives, you know, like, no, sorry, I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. I also, I, that's when I say, I want to be careful no. because it's, it's not, I, I don't want to make my statement in, in ex, like, um, how'd you say, uh, Ah, my, the word's missing me, but like in exclusion of, it's like, I, ideally, I want to say, it's like, hey, you can be beautiful. And, and again, in, in, in the, so we're even now, right now, we are so objectifying this beauty. It's like, okay, so th there's a beauty that you have externally, but I mean, there are women out there who maybe aesthetically have absolutely, they would not be fashion models and they are damn beautiful and powerful and what they're doing and how they do it and how they walk this earth is just, just make waves, you know, earthquakes. I think what I, what I, what I want to get back to, and again, it's the embodiment and it's the, the, to me, it's the true power. It's like right now, to me, the power is the, the energetic, like I can speak and it's what's, what's behind my voice. And it's a full somatic, like I'm alive in my whole body. And what that requires, perhaps we go back to what I learned in modeling to, to really stand in front of the camera. You need to be awake in your whole body. Yeah. And so when I work with clients, in some ways, like if you are in a leadership role, if you are trying to make decisions, if you, there's a new leadership that it requires that you are awake in your whole body, that when you need to have vision or make decision, it's not, it, it, it needs to go beyond just the cognitive, just the rational. It, it, it is a more full body uh, knowing and uh, and rousing. So when you say the yoga posture, can you do a sensual yoga posture? There's something about permission. Can you give yourself permission to be fully alive in whatever it is that you're doing? Yeah. And, and yeah. <laughs> you know, it's something about some life was really woken up for me when I lived in Brazil something about that South American, like full life and full, you know, as you say, permission to be sensual, sexual, but also just fully, fully alive, fully human, um, that, that shines through. And sometimes I'm working with someone and they're sort of doing the shape right, but there isn't that full presence. There isn't that full permission, that full juiciness that's there. So that, that definitely makes sense to me. Um, 
something else you mentioned in, in the notes, you know, ahead of time that you sent me was this idea of like, what's it in service to? Like, what is the embodiment in service to? So maybe you could speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I, I was I was super when, when I was so delighted that you invited me to speak here. And, you know, you have such an amazing lineup of people devoted to the embodiment and this wisdom of the body and, you know, thinking of how can I contribute? And and what the, the question that came up is like, OK, but this whole embodiment thing. Whatever it is that you're doing, whether it is meditation, movement, yoga, um, or just running, you know, lifting weights, whatever, in whatever way that you're seeking to be embodied, but what is it in service of? And, and so first, I, I just want to land that question, even now, for those who are listening right now, just say it right now. How do you connect to this, quote unquote, embodiment? because mm, it could be in just another thing to get right or another kind of case. And then it's another commodity, right? Yeah. Then, then it's just another currency. And so that, that's a distinction I wanted to make. It's like, so, so where I see, again, development, human development, when I work with, with clients, it's like it's making a distinction is, okay, so you're sitting here and maybe you feel an input. Well, first it's becoming aware, right? So we have what we're aware, what we're not aware and, and our needs. And so, so maybe you are embodied and you feel the impulse. You, be, you are, at, let me back up. Maybe you don't. And so you need to work the, your, the, your embodiment work is on becoming more available to your body. What do you feel? What do you sense in your body? Right? So that's the first step. It's like you have a body. What do you feel? What, you know, what do you sense? You touch your legs, you touch your, your hands, what you actually have fingers, you actually have shoulders. So even, you know, even that like if you just with your hands like go around your body like there is a leg not the idea of the leg but there's actually a leg and you know press your thigh that that is a thigh and that's what a thigh feels like <laughs> you know it's simple then there's an impulse of of needs right like so a more sophisticated embodiment or somatic is like okay yeah i'm aware of my body and I have this impulse and so, oh, I maybe it's in terms of relationships, like, oh, I need more connection or maybe in terms of, oh, I'm hungry and I need food or, or maybe it's more subtle. It's like, oh, I need some alone time or whatever it is. Right. And, and somatic starts informing, but it starts informing our needs. Yes. And, 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 and I, I, again, the distinction, of, it, this in, in the development, right. Is, but what is it in service of? So is, is the body just a machine that like a dashboard that lights up lights and then you feed it, right? Oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. So then some suddenly it becomes very, it can become very automatic. Or you were talking about the feminine shadow. Like I, I give a lot of talks and I work a lot with feminine shadow. And it is, I've also seen how then the somatic starts getting used as a weapon. So, okay, well, I'm sitting next to you and, oh, I'm aware, I feel contracted, you know, I don't feel safe with you. <laughs> or, you know, or, oh, my heart is open and, you know, this means blah, blah, blah. And so I just want to be careful that one thing is the somatic and another is what we, the story that we make of it. Yep, yes, it's two things. That, like one is acknowledging that like any tool, you know, uh, a scalpel you know the embodiment can be used uh in, in a way which is harmful manipulative unpleasant and it's not it's not just ethically a good thing but i'd, I'd say there is a sort of leaning towards ethics inherent in embodiment um but certainly to acknowledge that it can be um maybe we could talk a little bit more about feminine shadow like can you give an example of that like what is the what is this term for people that are new to the term shadow you know, what does that mean and what, what might be an example of that? Absolutely. So I want to make a distinction. When I say shadow, this is not the, you know, Jungian shadow, shadow work or anything. I'm defining feminine shadow as the unconscious um, ways that women use the um, to get their way. You know, it's like the what, and I mean, and I think men do it as well, but again, you know, I, I, coming from South America, I've watched women's, how they 
they what they use, how we unconsciously or in indirect ways, we manage situations so that we well, in some ways, can survive. Again, I don't. It's not. I don't. It's no shame, no blame. You right. know, the the feminine. I mean, women, and also just in, the feminine in general has been persecuted for thousands of years, and so it doesn't disappear. It just ha- has had to very intelligently find other ways to to survive, and mm-hmm. so we use the tools we have access to, right? And those tools may yeah. be money, it may be physical power, it may be. Uh, communication skills, emotional power, reputation damage, public shaming, etc. Yeah, and and again, it's whatever it is that you can use. I mean, women are shapeshifters, beautifully so, and we will become. And in, in, in our, I I also believe that our directive is to create, whether it is to create babies or to create uh, books or to create companies or to it, like. It's such an urge to manifest and create and bring forward. And so we will do whatever we, we need to do in order to do that. I mean, you have women in Africa that are, that, that are dying and there are still, you know, their bodies are still producing babies. <laughs> it's like, how is this possible? Because our drive for life to create is, is insatiable. Yeah. And right. It, so this beautiful desire to create and also acknowledging that, you know, people use what they're able to. So not, as you say, no shame, no blame here, right? Like it's like people have learned strategies and, you know, narrative. One of my friends has a, he runs a, um, a YouTube channel that's quite popular, David, um, is the, you know, the masculine shadow has been really brought out. The sort of misuses of male violence, male sexuality, like that's really come out and that's really good that that's getting called out. But if you were to say to some, you know, most people today, what is, say, toxic femininity, no one knows what that is. Or there's even a complete denial, like, you know, men are, gen- you know, men have a good side and a bad side. And there's, you know, things that men can do that's not very nice. Um, but women don't have that bad side. Women don't have that nasty side. They don't have a vindictive side or a cruel side. Or it's all feminine as a nurturer, feminine as creator. And there's no way women could kind of do anything nasty or mean. and uh, my sense is you're pretty. Sorry, and who's saying that? I think that's the mainstream culture today. I think it's the mainstream culture. There's a great video online where, uh, you know, I won't go into the details, but I would claim there's a move in mainstream culture towards um, recognizing masculine shadow, which I fully support. I think it's super helpful, super useful, but not so much the other side of things. And I've, you know, yeah. I've heard you tell stories which for me really clearly reveal this. And there seems to be, an, an, I, what I hear from you is an ownership of some of that potential nastiness. Yeah, so so the talk that I gave in Hungary when you and I met at the Integral European Conference was that it, it was my experience since I've been a little girl um, with other women and then as a model. Um, and then even now, um, as, a, as a working woman, entrepreneur and self-employed, is it, it's like, what I see is that, you know, women, I see women pointing fingers at structures, at men, at the patriarchy. And again, you know, yes, it is true, right? So yes. And I don't see the conversation of women, what women do to other women. How, um, you know, I've never been put down by a man and I've been destroyed by women. And right. so, you know, and it's, I know that my story is not unique. And, and, and beyond that story, the thing is, I probably have done the same. I, actually, I won't even say probably. And I have done the same. Yeah. And How so. We hurt each other uh, and men, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, so what I think what that speaks, what I, what I want to speak about in the feminine shadow is like what we do, what we do daily to, to position ourselves either with women or with men that then even the perhaps using what happened to you um is it is a form of power but but the cost when you position yourself as victim as a role to to make somebody a perpetrator you then need to be a victim and that's a that's a high cost you mean in terms of disempowerment like a responsibility disempowerment yeah exactly you know and so 
So I, I don't have the answer. It's just yeah. like th there has to be another way where we look at what what's happening and what's been, but where women, once again, where women don't have to disempower themselves. I was in Russia and um, was in the staff room of one of the courses I do there. And it was about six or seven women there, all of whom I respect, capable, intelligent women in the staff team. I, I just started thinking about some of this. And in many ways, I've had very positive experiences with women in terms of my family and my relationships. And I, I realized I'd been a bit naive in some ways. And I said to this room full of women, I said, how would you destroy me if you wanted to? And I spent the next 20 minutes listening to their potential strategies because they all sort of trusted me enough to sort of tell me what was really, you know. And these are nice, lovely human beings. And I was shocked by some of the things they came up with. And then I didn't I'm saying they've ever done this. I'm not saying that they, they, they certainly never done it to me. But the fact that they were all talking about it, and with a certain glee, I might add too. Um, I've never seen men talk about physical violence with such glee. Um, not in the circles I'm in anyway. And I was, it was a real eye-opener to me. Um, and I, I'd just like to sort of, if, you, if you'd be willing to kind of um, be vulnerable and say, like, what are some of those ways in which women hurt people that we could actually name? Because as I said, I think I'm pretty naive about this, if I'm honest, Maria. So if we go back to, let's say, the body, if, we, if you see your body as currency, mm -hmm. right? So, I, and again, I, I want to be careful with different cultures. It might not apply to your culture, but I come from Venezuela. So this is what I've seen. And maybe also I've seen it here in, in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so, so your body, if you, you know, we're talking about embodiment, but if you see your body as currency, one way, you know, a, a woman can cause, um, can, harm to herself and to others is where you you kind of give it away right is is is, is um as you say it's a commodity right like you you know i can give you this and you give me that uh it could be just the permission of you can touch my shoulder when you speak or i mean you full-on we can have sex right or full-on so so that's a commodity that that's one thing the equally it could be the opposite is that I, I, how do you say, I, 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 I remove it. My body and what like, kind of like the life force in my body is not available to you. And by denying it to you, it, it's, it's hard to be with a woman that is shut down. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm saying woman, cause you asked woman, but also for a man. Uh, it's really hard for me to be with a man that is, it's just like, it's not available. Yeah. And it, I feel suffocated and I'm, you know, I like, I don't want to, I'm not asking anything more than let's just be in reciprocity in this conversation. But in that, when they hold off their currency of their life force and their body and life force, I mean, like when you're sitting there and you're relaxed, right. And you're, you smile and you kind of exhale. Like an embodiment, it's just breath also. So it could be just how generous you are with your breath or how withholding you are with your breath in simple conversation. Wow. So that's quite subtle, right? And I, I, I remember I became aware that many of my female friends were sort of Pavlovianly conditioning me with touches. The, uh -huh. Whenever I did anything they liked, they gave me these sweet little touches. And it wasn't sexual, yeah. but it was feminine. And I, I like those little touches. And it was like, and I, and I noticed my male friends weren't doing that. And I was like, wow, there's a whole currency you're conditioning me with, but I didn't even realize. And I, you know, I've certainly been aware of um, women um, holding the carrot of potential sexual contact in exchange for actual time, resources, attention, free coaching, uh, free listening, you know, all these other sort of, some of which I provide professionally as services and with zero actual sexual intent. And some of them would even be honest with me about this and say, listen, I, you know, I've never sleep with you, but you know, like I like to flirt with you because it, it gets me what I want. And, and in some cultures that feels very honest and in other cultures it feels more under the surface. Um, okay, so then let's flip this whole thing around then, you know? Because you're, so we've been talking about a currency and how women use it and all of that. But then now let's talk about the, the, the beauty and what women through thousands of years in some ways, we are the keepers of. 
you know, through everything, how the feminine, you know, men and women, you know, the, the sensual, the embodied, the touching, the delicious, when I touch your skin, I, it, and even separate sexuality from sensuality, like right now, mm. with everything that, that is going on, like it, with those women that are just patting you and touching you, sure, we can look at it from the side of, um, well, you know, they, 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 they're kind of educating you, you know, but also we are keeping something alive that is so human and vital that it is touch, that it is sensuality, that we are embodied that like that, like, you know, that we talk about how we're going to be cruel to you and, and, and we just find the light. And it's not so much that the light of what they're going to do to you, but that I bet you were loving feeling these women in their own delight. Yeah, and, and thank you for bringing that, Maria. I think it's trying to be sort of fair to both sides of things here is really tricky, huh? Because quickly it's easy for, and I can imagine people listening may get reactive one way or the other. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. the internet, you know, it's like, oh, all women are bitches, or oh, women are all pure and beautiful, and just the keepers of feminine goodness. And you know, I appreciate that we're trying, trying to sort of move backwards and forwards between um, these two sides, as it were, the light and the dark, and. You know, sometimes I feel like female friends will, like touch me and just help me feel again. And they're like saying, yes. remember you're alive and it's okay. And I see women doing this with each other. Like my friend at that conference we're at, there's a beautiful picture of her in the public domain on, you know, it's in Facebook public. So I don't think, you know, I can speak about it of her sort of being sort of touched and loved by three other women at the conference. And uh, and it was like this instinctive response where they could see she was having a tough time. They kind of came to her and nourished her and loved her and sort of helped her feel herself again and come back to life. It was a sort of spiritual, emotional CPR session. And I looked at them doing that. I was like, wow, that is fucking great, you know? Yeah. And so then, so then this is where, you know, when, when you hear like, oh, you know, women, the goddesses and stuff and, you know, the, all that. I actually, I mean, so there's everything that they built, you know, that upon. But it's to me, again, it would be just, we are the guardians of a certain level of humanity. You know, we are the life bearers. You know, we give birth and we are the mothers, and then there's a there's a humanity and a sensuality that in the in the in the culture that we're living, we're, we're almost being shamed because we want touch or we want we enjoy touch mm -hmm. or we or if I touch you or if and and, and it, then we make it mean more than or less than and in all of that and there's a distortion right there there is a truth to that right of appropriate touch or inappropriate but the the thing is is that the more we keep it away the less we get, we are educated on what it is that we need how it is that we need it when it is that we need it how do we keep healthy boundaries how do we speak our desires, how we just speak of, you know, maybe I just want you to hold my hand. Maybe I just, you know, what is appropriate or not? It needs to be out in the conversation. And the beauty, I think, or, or here I would stand like women, men, do not give up your your sensory, your desire for, for what it is to be human on how this afternoon wind feels on your cheek of how the grass feels on your feet or simply like you're sitting in your office and you just love your chair and it feels good what feels good you know it yeah anyway lovely lovely beautiful stuff and you know, I'm aware as we sort of start to move towards close and I've, I've lent the conversation in a certain direction based on, you know, what I knew of you before. And I, I've only had a snapshot of what you do. Um, is there any kind of other aspects of your work or your passions that you kind of feel like you want, you want to bring in here? Yeah, thank you. So it, it's what I want to speak about or what I want to invite is imagine like, like everything that you do has this experience of wholeness. Because we also, you know, you speak embodiment and so, well, then I need to be a yoga teacher if I'm embodied or I need to be, uh, you know, an athlete, you know, or then I'm just not embodied. But then, you know, I, I pursue my career and and what I'm passionate about, you know, again, 
through the the life that I've had as a fashion model and a developmental geek and Zen priest is that at any given moment, all those things are available to you. There is a, so how I work with my clients or how I like to work with people, whether I'm like this, like I'm giving an inspirational speech or I'm working with groups is, is opening that awareness both into where you are located right now in your body, what's available to you. And then is it, what is it in service of, you know, is it, um, you know, where's the growth, where's the growth edge for you um, in terms of what you are aware of. And so again, you can be sitting at your desk and you can be feeling, feeling fully alive um and it doesn't need to mean that you're there on your desk and you know perspir how you say it? perspirating is that how you say it perspirating uh, sweating <laughs> perspir perspirating you know because you're so hot no like just like it's, it's a level of aliveness that then it starts nurturing it starts nurturing then your emotional experience you, you become more relaxed more at peace you're then the way you then you relate you take that at home in your relationships then the way then you you open to all things you nature or at any given moment and so anyway i I wanted to speak about, I like to think, I like to think that the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and a, so, yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, maybe you don't have a full hour to do a yoga thing every day or, but, but then where is, you know, where are you? Where's your body? What what's your availability? And then, yes, you're not alone. You know, that's why you do the work that you do, Mark. That's why I do the work that I do. And and then, you know, be open to what is already available to you, supporting you, helping you become more more alive. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. Hmm. Well, I guess beauty was one of our kind of themes here, and it's um it's been interesting, you know, because we've got the camera off today because the um usually on these interviews for listeners we can see each other but today because i'm in a hotel i was worried about the wi-fi we're just kind of on the audio but it's um you know the sort of beauty of your passion and uh, care and poetry here is really coming across to me so um mm. thank you thank you and thank you for inviting me and so i think this speaks of what we're talking about that we we are not seeing each other face to face in video and yet it's palpable yeah. right what the 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 it's somatic for me. I'm here. I'm just, you know, just, how do you say, making gestures with my hands and smiling, even though I'm not seeing your face. And I think that speaks to what we're the point that we're trying to make here is that that aliveness, that embodiment is beyond just what it looks like, like the virtual aspect of, of the shape of your face or your body. Great. Yeah. It circles back around to that original point you've made at the start of the interview. And I mean, let's just go practical here. So if people want to get in touch or find out more about what you do, Maria, where's, where should they go? Absolutely. So the, the easiest way is just to go to my website, mariabailey.co, C-O, and, and you can reach me there and it'll speak about my coaching and stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, I give talks, I facilitate groups, whether it is just in more embodiment or even in becoming what's available for teams. So if teams want to be more effective, more emotional intelligence, you know, it's yeah, fascinating. And then just let's be in the conversation. Who knows? Maybe you have something yet a challenge for me to grow into your what's our growth edge together. So, yeah. Maria, thank you. I think this has been um, deep, thoughtful. You know, I, I really felt like we're modeling conversations that need to happen between men and women that kind of go to some tough topics, but where there's kind of mutual respect and I, I hope mutual listening. So um, for me, this, is, this has been, you know, really good use of my time and I'm, I'm hoping um, listeners will get a lot from it too. Same. Thank you. And thank you for all the listeners. I can't wait into your comments and, you know, d differing opinions are definitely uh, welcome and stay open, stay open. Maybe there's something that is new for you. And what is the somatic experience in your body when you face difference? And so be aware of that, even as you're typing your, 
your comment. <laughs> <laughs> the angry comments. I don't think we took any. I think it's really faithful to everyone on this. I hope. I hope. Okay, Maria, yeah. so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, be well. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're, most people I think listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual, you know, links to the sites, this comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.